as you know, the Navy has said they were going to be doing an environmental impact statement. And as part of that statement, there is something called a scoping meeting. And at that scoping meeting, you, the public, get a chance to tell the Navy what you would like them to study. In other words, if something is a concern to you, bring that to the meeting and you'll have a chance to talk to the people from the Navy and to get your questions and your problems and concerns and you'll be able to write them down. We went to the, uh, there was a meeting up in Oak Harbor and we just kind of went up there the other day to uh, find out what, uh, what the physical shape of the building is, what, how, they, how they do it, how they operate, and everything like that. And basically, there are a couple of tables in the center where you can fill out your comments. And then around the outside of the room, there will be uh, some informational displays. And that will be staffed by Navy people to answer your questions. And they'll answer any questions you want to answer. They may or may not know the answer. Um, because this is a team that, as far as I'm aware, travels from one EIS to another. So they may be doing uh, one scoping meeting here, then another scoping meeting in Texas, and on Thursday, another scoping meeting in Maryland. And over on that desk here, we have a sheet called Possible Comments for Environmental Impact Statement. That is, just pick one up, and that will help give you an idea of some of the things that we, uh, the citizens of EB's Reserve, have, have in, in talking to people, have noticed these are the concerns. This is, this is what the problems are. So grab a hold of one of these. And you can, you can say to the Navy, I want to find out about what are you, how are you possibly going to protect our children playing at a ballpark. We've got Rhododendron Park right over here. These kids are playing under 117 decibels. What are you guys going to do about it? You know, so you'll get that chance. You'll get that chance. Um, okay, another thing we have, uh -huh. we've got a captive audience here. We need money. Uh, there are our envelopes over, over, over on that table and this whole effort is funded by you. We don't have a bunch of fat cats or anything like that. It's funded by you guys because we're working for you. None of us are paid. It's an effort. We said, this is so important to me that I'm going to dedicate my life to it right now. And that's what I'm doing. And if you don't have the time, maybe you got some money because everything is expensive. Why, this room, 50 bucks. That's not much. It's 50 bucks, just the same. Okay, another thing that will be brought up and talked about quite a bit tonight is the Jerry Lilly sound report. That it also was available here, and it will be talked about and referred to throughout the evening. Now, yeah, read this whole thing, look through it, but there are basically just a couple of things that concern us, and that is how the sound is measured. Now, these people get into how some of the sound is measured. But what does that mean to me? When we moved here, uh, there was this thing called a sound map. Hey, cool. I knew a little bit about decibels, and I knew that anything above 85 decibels was uh, going to cause trouble in my hearing. So I saw the sound map and it said, I'm in a, like a 70 decibel area. Your life is good. Until I found out what they're talking about is something called LDN. Okay? LDN is a sound measurement averaged over a year. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, isn't that interesting? The Navy says the best way we could measure sound is to average it out over a year. Well, think about this. One jet goes over, and that's maybe, I'm just taking an isolated example, to cause instantaneous hearing damage. It makes you deaf, okay? One jet. Now, if you do an LDN figure on that one jet, 
and you average it throughout the year, it's going to come out to, oh, maybe an LDN of three decibels. Hey, that's not bad, is it? I'll buy that house. It's in a 65 decibel area, an LDN. You know, okay. So what you're doing is you're looking at this false figure. You're looking at a false figure called LDN, day, night, average. There is a 10% penalty when the jets fly at night, and that bumps it up. What we feel is a more uh, germane way to measure sound is SEL, single event. Let's take a look at that one jet coming over at 134.2 decibels in Admiral's Cove. World Health Organization found out recently that uh, most hearing damage is done cumulatively. But at 115 decibels, it's instantaneous. OK? Now, every, what is it, every three decibels, the sound intensity doubles? Who knows that one? Yeah, yeah th every three decibels, the sound intensity uh, doubles. OK, so what's, or 10, OK, 10. So at 115 decibels, instantaneous hearing damage starts. And the people in Admiral's Cove get 134. Okay? What is that doing to you? That's what we're going to find out tonight. We're going to find out what the difference between what the Navy says is 65 decibels LDN, which doesn't sound bad at all, and what 134.2 decibels does to your body, not just to your hearing, to your body. And we've got some really, really good uh, speakers here to share this with us. And uh, these resumes are incredible. Okay, we got Karen Bowman, RN, is an environmental health specialist with the Washington State Nurses Association. She's a native of Seattle and, and has been advocating for safe and equitable working condition and environmental health for over two decades. She has an advanced practice degree in community health systems with a special focus in occupational and environmental health. Karen partners with the Department of Occupational Safety and Health and employers to ensure healthy and safe environments for workers. She is the past president of the Washington State Chapter of the Association of Occupational Health Nurses and is certified occupational health nurse, nurse specialist. Catherine Carr, MD, PhD, woo, is the director of the Northwest Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, where she sets the direction of the unit. Dr. Carr is a board certified pediatrician with a doctoral degree in epidemiology and master's degree in environmental health and toxology. Dr. Carr will be addressing the impacts of jet noise on children's health. She is an associate professor with the, Washington, with the University of Washington Department of Pediatrics. She practices primary care pediatrics and does pediatric teaching at the UW Pediatric Care Center Roosevelt Clinic. She also provides specialty consultation for pediatric environmental medicine care at this clinic. Her academic appointments are in pediatrics and the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. Her research focuses on environmental exposures and respiratory health of children, including asthma. Dr. Carr is a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Executive Council on Environmental Health. And Nancy Eifert, is it Baudet or Baudet? Baudet. Baudet um, is the exposure scientist for the Northwest Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit and the UW Occupational and Environmental Medicine Clinic. She's the PEHSU program manager and provides leadership on occupational and pediatric environmental health projects. She investigates chemical, physical, which is noise, and biological, which is molds, and exposures to ensure physicians have the best exposure information possible for patient care and for responding to inquiries. She conducts detailed patient exposure histories and patient-related work site investigations. She reviews the published literature and communicates with parents, consultants, employers, regulators, and others as needed to obtain accurate exposure information. She's a certified industrial hygienist and graduate of the University of Washington Industrial Hygiene and Safety Program. 
She has extensive experience conducting compliance inspections for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, we all know that as OSHA, and the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries. So ladies and gentlemen, these people know of what they speak. Uh, Karen is going to be first, so now I'll turn it over to her. So what this group of women, including myself, what we're going to be doing is overviewing the health effects caused by noise, caused by aircraft noise, caused by military aircraft noise. I'm going to be t discussing the health effects related to adults, and this fine group is going to be discussing the health effects uh, on children, and then we're, go we're collaborating together to discuss um, the summary and findings and next steps. Okay? So in, let me see here. There we go. So what an experience you guys have had since 1941. And in reading some of the history, I, I apologize, I won't have the emotions attached to it as much as you guys have because you've been living this for the last however many years. But in briefly reviewing, so everybody's on the same page, it started in September of 1942 when the U.S. Naval Air Station Whidbey was commissioned. And then by the following September, the OLF was up and running. After World War II, uh, we were hoping that it would have been decommissioned. It wasn't. And in fact, um, flights increased. In the 70s, it became the West Coast Training and Operations Center for the All-Weather Bomber Squadron. In the 80s, the Whidbey Islanders Sound Environment Coalition partnered with the Navy to reduce some of the exposures because the flights were getting worse and worse and worse. And so they collaborated with the Navy to set limits on the exposure. No flights after 10.30 p.m. No more than two days of flights in a row. No weekends. But in 1993, many of the flight stations closed, and so many of them moved here to Whidbey, right? So again, the flights increase. 2008. The flights, again, just keep on going, keep on going, and then we hit 9-11. We hit 9-11, and then all bets were off. Flights increased. Uh, we changed planes to uh, more te technologically advanced planes, or bombers, rather. The noise level went up. The flight numbers went up. And um, looking at 2010, by 2010, you guys were experiencing over 3,200 flights a year. In 2012, and they, and they closed that, uh, 13,300 flights. So, you know, under, that's a lot of exposure, and you guys have been living with that noise for years. So we all have backgrounds in public health, occupational environmental health. And so I want to do a few definitions so we're all on the same page. Um, so you can understand that this is truly a, a chronic public health issue, right? So public health is all about protecting and promoting population health, which is the defining goals of public health practice. We assess and monitor the health issues in the community and at populations, uh, populations at risk. We develop policies, we set priorities to solve these health problems, and we also assess to make sure that populations are getting adequate health care. Healthy people, anybody aware of Healthy People? The Healthy People Project? Healthy People provides science-based 10-year national ob objectives, and in the 20 Healthy People 2020, there's two objectives that address 
uh, adult and adolescent hearing loss. So the goal is to reduce noise-induced hearing loss in both those populations. And I'm speaking about adults. The most vulnerable populations are children. And again, talking about environmental health, environmental health comprises those aspects of human health, including quality of life, quality of life. And that's a big issue with um, the, this aircraft noise that's determined by physical, chemical, biological, social, and psychological factors in the environment. And it refers, refers to the theory of theory and practice of assessing and abating those those exposures so we can protect human health and uh, for populations to come. So what exactly is noise? The EPA defines noise as unwanted or disturbing sounds. And what, def what is an unwanted or disturbing sound? Anything that affects my activities of daily living. If, if I can't hear my favorite TV show, if I, can't be, if I can't hear my children out playing in the, in the front yard, that's vigilance. If I can't hear my, you know, make sure my elderly parents are okay in the back room. If I'm continually being woken up at night, that's disturbing sound. And that affects our activities of daily living. So I want to talk, I want to read a little bit about the Noise Control Act. The Noise Control Act was created in 1972. It's completely outdated. You know, there's other federal laws that were created about that same time. The air standard, the water standard, both of those have been updated. There's other standards that need to be updated, um, including the Noise Control Act. In the 70s, we could still smoke on planes. We didn't have to wear seat belts. And that's when John Travolta in that decade was doing the, you know, Saturday night fever thing. Totally, this is totally outdated and, and we need to update this act. But let me tell you, even back in the 70s, what they said about annoyance noise. It states, inadequately controlled noise presents a growing danger to the health and welfare of the nation's population, in particular urban areas. This annoyance can have significant consequences to, the, to health, to human health. And that was back in 1972 when they didn't have advanced technology in these planes. And they didn't have the number, you know, it's steadily growing. Your exposure is steadily growing. So Michael um, explained a little bit about decibels, but I'm going to get into it a little bit more. A decibel is a measurement of loudness that ranges from the threshold of hearing to the threshold of pain, so zero to about 140 decibels. And the word decibel is two words. It comes from deci, which is one-tenth, and bell, which is named after Alexander Bell. Alexander Graham Bell, who invented, who, who found the decibel. An A-weighted average, the A that you'll see by the decibel, is always, um, usually always environmental measurement is A-weighted. And it weighs the sound pressure levels to frequency to, cor to correspond with human hearing. So that's very important. Two other measurements, the LAQ, which determines the steady state noise level of a specific time period. It's a good measure of impact of a series of events during a specific time period. And the LMAX is a peak measurement at a specific time. So beep, that's the LMAX. And those are, those are significant um, definitions that you'll find in the Lilly report. So Washington state law, the legislator, I just want to read this a little bit. The legislature finds that inadequately controlled noise adversely affects health and safety and welfare of people, the value of property, and the quality of the environment. So we're building a case. And you guys, I'm sure you guys all know that all the laws are there to protect 
human health in this instance hearing. Anti-noise anti measures in the past have not adequately protected against the invasion of these interests by noise. There's a need, therefore, for an expansion of efforts statewide directed towards abatement and control. And that's what you guys are doing. That's what the WISE organization did, trying to reduce the exposure and control of noise, considering the socioeconomic impact upon the community and the state. And so the Washington WAC code and the RCW states that the maximum noise in a residential setting should be 55 decibels during the day. Such a joke. <laughs> 45 at night. And the Lilly Report, their LMAX was 113.4 9, decibels up to 119.2. That's, the Navy is out of compliance. Totally out of compliance. And the L average over a 24-hour period was 64.1 to 75 out of compliance. Navy's out of compliance. You know, Nancy and I do compliance with, with OSHA and with um, l and I. And if I had a company that was out of compliance, they'd be busted. They'd be fined. How do we do this <laughs> with the Navy? So I want to talk a little bit about the ears, do a little bit of A&P here. We have two of them usually. <laughs> we have the outer ear, the, in, the middle ear, which is your ear canal, and then the inner ear. And the inner ear is the thing that we're really concerned about right now. Right here. This is the inner ear, the cochlea. And what's so um, important about that is inside the cochlea is the organ of corti. And that has 16,000 little hair sensors that help translate sound waves that go into our ear. It works with the um, eighth cranial nerve, the acoustic nerve, to help make sound understandable for us. Hearing is an incredible sense that helps us enjoy the music of life, right? It helps us communicate, it, it alerts us to danger. Matter of fact, hearing is the primary sense for sensing danger. It's 10 times more sensitive than, than um, vision. And unlike the eye that has a lid that can turn off the sensation and the exposure, the ear doesn't have that. And that's, and that's critical in the health effects of adults because when you're trying to sleep at night, your brain processes that injurious aircraft noise as danger and it sets a cascade of events of um, cortisols and other hormones that get released. The fight or flight hormones, have you guys heard of those? I had to take notes. I didn't want to miss one part of this stuff, this research. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about hearing loss, stress hormones and health, the immune system, psych psychosocial impacts and cognition because it affects all of that. But the most exquisite research I found that had significant evidence was that it causes cardiac disease. It causes hypertension and can actually, there's statistical significance about uh, airplane noise, specifically nighttime exposure to airplane noise, causing heart attacks. Going back to the ear again. So um, Michael was talking about 85 decibels. Well, in my occupational health setting, we know that if we do noise measurements in the workplace setting, if noise is at um, 85 or above, we implement a hearing conservation program. And then further steps, we implement hearing protection. Because we know at 85 and above, over an eight-hour time-weighted average, the probability of you sustaining hearing loss 
is pretty good. But let's, let's talk about the difference between occupational exposure and what you guys are facing, the environment, environmental exposure. So in my workplace setting, those workers typically are being exposed to 2,080 hours, say. That's a, that's a year's work, worth of work, of that occupational noise, which, by the way, they're being protected. They're being trained and protected, hopefully. In the environment, in the situation that you're in, it's not 2,080 hours. It's 24-7 and you have not had any training, and you don't have hearing protection, right? Is there anybody out there that does wear hearing protection? Do you guys wear plugs? Have you been trained on how to, how to put the plugs in? Couple people? Good job, good job. So you can train everybody else. <laughs> so there's three types of hearing loss. There's conductive, sensory neural, and then a combination of both. Conductive is kind of mechanical. It's, you've got a big plug of wax in your ear, possibly a tumor, infection causing swelling, perforated eardrum. That's um, conductive. Sensory neural is more common, and unfortunately, once it happens, we can't usually fix it. And that's what we're that's what the issue is um, related to what you guys are being exposed to. The severity of hearing loss is determined by the intensity, the duration, and the frequency of the noise. And symptoms of hearing loss, can somebody tell me what those symptoms are? Because I bet you're having them. Ringing. Ringing in the ears, yeah, tinnitus. And then muffled, muffled sound. I have hearing loss. I have hearing loss, I bet you, because I used to go and watch the airplanes land at SeaTac with my grandpa, when I, and grandpa and grandma when I was, you know, six and seven, eight years old. And we were very, very close to those planes. We do know that, that noise is a biological stressor. Excessive noise, especially aircraft and military noise, is a health risk and contribute to a host of diseases and, and exacerbations of chronic conditions that you might already have. Anxiety, stress, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, heart attacks, gastrointestinal um, problems, migraine headaches. And there is some research, although we need to do more research in this area, about um, noise causing uh, the immune system to falter. So here's the, here's the whole etiology of aircraft noise. Starts with commercial chronic um, exposure to the aircraft noise. Then you get that increased stress load. And then chronic psychophysiological stress is activated. That's when your, those fight or flight hormones go wacky. You develop adverse health effects and reduce quality of life and vitality of life. Two critical pathways, sleep disturbance and noise-induced stress were identified as um, major pathways in my research with adults. And both have been related to uh, negative cardiac outcomes. And through multiple studies, researchers have shown nighttime aircraft noise to be much worse than daytime noise or 24-hour um, noise exposure. And again, there's also research that talks about the relationship between sleep loss and the immune system. Again, we, we need to study that a little bit further. And um, noise exposure and um, increased um, probability and susceptibility to viral infections. And if you're working with toxics, the increased potential for um, having delirious effects to those toxic substances. But again, that needs to be researched a little bit further. So this is a great schematic that, that identifies the disturbances when we can't do our activities of daily living. 
So we can't do our task because we can't hear the person. For example, if you're working and one of those planes goes over or noise, you can't hear the other person. You certainly can't hear if there's something, you know, if there's a dangerous thing going on. Sleep disturbances, physiological health effects, your blood pressure increases, psychological effects, stress, anxiety. And somebody was talking about PTSD even. And I haven't seen that in the research. I'm not sure if you guys found that in the research, but it seems plausible. Anecdotally, it sounds plausible to me. And then it comes down to here. Again, it's overall quality of life. What's your quality of life having these planes going over so much? And it does um, affect uh, your, um, your lifespan and increases the potential for illness, chronic exacerbation of the disease that you might already have. Psychosocial impacts and cognition, we do know that there are studies, occupational health studies, that show that if workers are exposed to loud noise, their ac accidents increase, they get anxious. We also know that um, noise is, uh, the response to noise is annoyance. Aircraft noise interferes with the activities of daily living like we've talked about already, and the dose response is directly related to um, the noise level. And the louder the aircraft noise, the less an individual is able to adapt. And if you feel that you can't adapt, then quite often the symptom, your symptoms increase and you become more anxious. So this is a schematic of, one, of two research, um, big pieces of research that I came across. This is the hyena report that identified a direct correlation to um, aircraft noise, noise, specifically nighttime aircraft noise with increased um, potential for hypertension. And for those science people out there, um, the odds ratio was uh, over one. It was 1.13 and 1.14 with a 95% um, confidence interval of um, well, well, with 95% confidence interval. So it really does, it's, it, what's that, what I'm saying is that it really does, it's very much correlated to um, the exposure. Another study, the Babbage study, had a high significance relating nighttime exposure to cardiovascular um, accidents and, and um, heart attacks as well, and it had similar um, odds ratios, so it's very significant finding. This still, ne this needs a little more research as far as um, metabolic syndrome, but anecdotally you can see it, um, because of the stressors, we, we're understanding now that if you don't sleep well, it can lead to obesity. That has, that's directly related to diabetes, and all these, you know, the whole body kind of fits together and it does create heart disease. But this still right here with, um, with aircraft noise, we still need to do a little bit more research with, with, um, with that. This is what I found that was astounding. The um, physical characteristics of military low altitude flight noise. And it's different in terms of other noise. It's extremely, um, extremely high maximal sound levels. And remember in the Lilly study, we had a number of those, and they were way over um, uh, normal standards. And the very rapid increase in sound levels um, during direct overflights increases community annoyance and increases um, health effects. And it, again, talking about. Um, low altitude overflight noise, it's strongly associated with cardiovascular disease and sleep disturbances, and even during the quiet time. So when you're exposed and you by chance happen to have an opportunity where you don't have overflights, you're still having that stress. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some studies in the research. This was a study in Minnesota using four neighborhoods exposed to commercial aircraft in um, aircraft airports and two as controls. 
And all the health measures in the surveys were significantly worse worse in those exposed communities. And in re, uh, reviewing a number of, I haven't had an opportunity to go through all the surveys yet that you guys have conducted here, but it seems very similar that it does affect your quality of life. We do know that two potential pathways to cardiovascular disease is sleep disruption and no noise-induced stress. We do know that cardiovascular arousal during the waking and sleeping periods creates increased hypertension, uh, increased blood pressure. We do know that high blood pressure is related to cardiac disease and uh, in particular heart attacks. And significant findings relate noise to blood pressure changes and especially to the development of hypertension. In just reviewing a few more, there was the Los Angeles study that determined chronic exposure to aircraft noise, again, raised blood pressure. There's a plethora, plethora of research that directly links aircraft noise and specifically military low-flying aircraft noise to hypertension and cardiac, negative cardiac outcomes. A Munich study linked chronic noise exposure to increased blood pressure when people were doing cognitive tasks. There was a, um, a Boston, a multi-airport re retrospective study in Boston that also determined they used ICD-9 codes in hospitals, and ICD-9 codes are billing codes that correlate with diagnoses, and they found that uh, communities around commercial airports had higher incidences of cardiac ICD-9 codes. And then the Swiss National Cohort Study, again, used ICD-9 codes, 65 airports uh, and airfields, and um, it showed acute and chronic noise exposure, in particular aircraft noise, being associated to high blood pressure, heart attacks, increased cardiovascular medication dispensation, cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, and the risk of death from heart attacks was higher in individuals to exposed to, that were exposed to aircraft noise of 60 decibels or more when exposed to um, particulate matter. And we haven't even begun to talk about jet um, fuel and some of the other issues that, that surround um, this issue. That will be a different lifetime, I think. And this goes back to the um, hyena report, and again, talking about statistical significance. So the higher the l night decibels, going from 35 to 80, the higher the odds ratio for hypertension. And you guys are, are all over here. So in, in summarizing, we do know that there's significant health effects associated with, in adults, with aircraft noise. It's, the, it's increased with nighttime exposure of aircraft noise. And it has, and it's everything from cognitive impairment to problems with memory, memory recall, being able to um, complete tasks, to all the way to cardiac disease, hypertension, and heart attacks and death. And it's especially significant, as I mentioned, with, um, in particular, with low altitude overflights, which is what you guys are experiencing. In talking to some of you, I've heard that you could actually see the helmets of the pilots. You know, I'm a private pilot. I haven't flown for a number of years, but I had a regulation. I couldn't fly any lower than 500 feet. And I'm telling you, I could never see any. I, nobody could see me in my little Cessna 150, which was kind of like a Volkswagen bug with wings on it. And you guys are getting dive bombed. Well, I thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to my partners here who are going to discuss the health effects of children. And pardon? Was there a comment? No? Samantha, yes. Has anybody studied the increased incidence of medical problems at Ruby General Hospital? I have not seen any data. 
Oh, the question, the Q&A will be at the end. Okay, so hold that question because I think it's a great question. So I'll turn it over to Catherine Carr and Samantha, are you gonna be talking? I do. Um, so my name is Catherine Carr, and I'm here with my uh, colleagues from the University of Washington in our role with something called the PACU, the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. And if you want to know a little bit more of like who these people are, what this is about, we have you know the, the document here that kind of describes the unit. Basically, this is a federal program. There's one in every region of the country uh, at an academic medical center designed to be a place that communities such as this case, healthcare providers, other doctors and nurses, public health professionals, families can go if they have questions about something to do with children's health and environmental factors. So we really deal with the broad spectrum of things. When the community organization contacted the PACU and, say, and asked us, could we provide some information on this question of impacts of children of aircraft noise, of course, we, we wanted to be able to help because that's what we do. But first of all, it's not an area that you can find a good review article on in one place. And um, it's not an issue that we had had that question before. So we didn't have something we could just pull out of our you know, file cabinet or our virtual file cabinet, our computers. And so what the community organization was looking for was really someone to provide that good review of what, what, is this, what do we know as a scientific community, a medical community about these issues, and can you summarize that and synthesize it for us in a way that's meaningful for, for our questions in our community? And I said, well, we can kind of do that. We don't actually have enough resources to, to do that in-depth review. But what I did say is we, I can recommend a scientist I know that I've worked with in the past who has the appropriate background to be able to do that review for you, and that's Samantha Serrano, who's going to present the bulk of our presentation tonight, because she got into the weeds of the literature to find the relevant research and to critically evaluate it uh, for tonight. I said what I can do, and the center can do, is do peer review of her work and provide the administrative oversight so that we could synthesize it into a simple fact sheet, which you'll find here tonight, you know, crystallizing some of the main points, um, and help kind of just you know, facilitate this event tonight and being here to answer questions. So that's a little more backdrop into the presentation. So we're moving into kids here. Karen alluded to this concept that children might be more vulnerable to noise. And this is a mantra of children's environmental health. Children are not small adults. And in many scenarios of exposures, whether we're talking about chemicals or physical agents like noise, there are specific differences of children that make them more vulnerable. For noise, one of the big issues is this thing of the fact that children are growing and developing. And one of the health endpoints or impacts that we're going to focus on tonight is learning, reading comprehension, learning. Well, what is one of the most important things that a kid needs to be doing? Learning in an optimal environment that fosters that. And so if you have a hazard that disrupts learning, that is very important. Um, Children are not small adults in that they really rely on us to provide safe and healthy environments. And they don't necessarily avoid unhealthy or unsafe environments. If there's a great ball game going on at the play field and it happens to include exposure to noise that may be hazardous for them, are they going to decide not to play with their friends? No. You know, kids rely on us to provide environments that are safe for them in the places that they spend time. Kids are lucky, they tend to spend more time outdoors than you and I. So on average, if there's exposures of a concern in the ambient or outdoor environment, they typically have higher doses than adults. And Karen talked about one of the primary impacts of concern for adults is cardiovascular disease. We, we know that this is a complex kind of disease. There are many risk factors associated with, with it. But some of the changes that occur that lead to ultimate heart disease in adults start in early life, in early childhood. So we're going to uh, talk a little bit about how noise might impact the cardiovascular system of children and really set the stage for that later development of cardiovascular disease. 
So children are not small adults, and in many ways, they're more vulnerable than adults to something like noise. Samantha Serrano is going to take you through, hopefully in a helpful way, any epidemiologists in the room or public health specialist? Got one, great. Um, well, maybe, you know, if, if I miss something, you can, you can chime in or ask questions later. But for most of you, this area of how does, you know, how does noise affect children's health is going to be new, and you don't have the opportunity or the means to, you know, dive into the literature and the evidence base. And so what we wanted to do is try to provide for you a good critical evaluation and synthesis of that evidence base in a meaningful way for particularly focusing in on aircraft noise and uh, focusing on epidemiological studies or human health studies rather than rats in a lab that you expose to noise. Uh, in the case of noise in child health, there's actually a number of well-designed epidemiological studies to ask the question, what are the impacts on children? Most of these are um, with commercial aircraft exposure, so kids who might live close to airports versus far from major airports or natural experiments where the airport is moving or there's changes to the airport, so it, the exposure is changing to children. So these are the kinds of studies that Samantha is going to take you through uh, where we have, um, from, from looking at the literature, we've summarized here that there are some outcomes or impacts in children that are pretty clear and pretty strongly supported by the evidence. And that includes things like learning, effects on motivation, and annoyance. There are also some health impacts and outcomes associated with noise exposure in children from these epidemiological studies listed here. The studies are maybe less in number, uh, less powerful designs, and so we put them in a, in a bucket we call less consistent evidence. And some, some of those concerning outcomes include effects on memory and attention, stress, including stress hormone changes, cardiovascular effects as seen in adults, hearing loss, which is probably the first things people think about with effects of noise on children or adults, and behavioral disorders, things like attention. There are other health concerns associated with noise that researchers and scientists wonder about in children, but we don't have good studies or good evidence to say yay or nay or to inform us about how much is too bad. And that's our bucket we call no good studies in children. Okay, so that's the over, this is the, you know, this is the, you know, Big summary, and now Samantha Serrano is going to take you through a little bit more how we came to this summary slide. Samantha? So I am going to start off with the um, effects that we've seen the most consistent evidence. And Catherine mentioned um, children being in the school setting. That's where they, most of them spend their time. Therefore, a lot of researchers have focused um, the investigations in the setting. And actually, impaired learning is one of the most well-studied outcomes um, for children of school um, age and the most consistent for reading comprehension and academic performance. Um, one recent study showed an increase in aircraft noise dose was related to a decrease in reading comprehension on the 15 most difficult questions on these tests that were administered. Um, two other studies showed that um, children in areas of high aircraft noise exposure had poor reading scores than um, those in quieter settings. And within one of these studies, um, an interesting finding was that the closure of an airport led to decreases in this type of impairment, while the opening of a new airport actually led to the onset of these reading comprehension impairments. Um, then there was a study conducted by the Federal Interagency Committee on Aviation Noise, and they found a decrease in failure rates on standardized tests after aircraft noise was reduced. Um, annoyance, which triggers feelings of irritation, discomfort, distress, frustration, and offense, was another effect that was studied. And um, kids' self-rating of these feelings um, showed that as 
aircraft noise dose increased, so did the levels of annoyance. And this was exhibited in a cross-national study um, in Europe. And when comparing high aircraft noise exposure areas of schools and homes um, to those uh, in quieter settings, um, annoyance levels are higher in the noisy areas. And this is consistent um, with adult studies, as Karen mentioned, and across, um, excuse me, across um, several geographical regions, as you can hear. All of these, there's been studies in all of these countries which have shown the same effect. And annoyance is, is important because this can, you know, if the child is having these very negative feelings, this could impact um, other aspects of their life, such as learning. Um, so motivation was something that was also uh, studied. Um, a research group in Los Angeles did this by um, examining whether a failure or success on a puzzle-solving task would influence the performance on a second puzzle-solving task. And what was found was that the children in the high aircraft noise exposure areas um, were more likely to fail or to give up on trying on the second puzzle-solving task. And this uh, protocol was used in other studies. They found the same uh, types of results. And one thing that I wanted to mention about the studies that I just discussed is that um, the investigators um, took into account other factors that could have potentially impacted the health outcomes that were studied. Things like socioeconomic status, um, learning disabilities, or hearing impairments of the participants. And so um, by taking these characteristics and controlling for them, either through statistical uh, analysis or through the study design, um, it makes the evidence, it makes the results more robust. And um, we are confident that the findings are due to aircraft noise exposure and not the other study, not the other factors. Um, in the literature review, we also found effects that had less consistent evidence. For example, the studies on attention and memory had varying results. Um, one study looking at attention found um, better, better attention for students in high aircraft exposure regions. Another study showed worse attention, and another two other studies showed no significant effects at all. And there's also inconsistent results for the four studies that were found on memory. In regards to perceived stress, well-being, and overall health, um, there was a tendency toward this higher quality of psychological well-being in students that were in uh, quieter areas, but not for um, physical or social aspects of well-being. And also, no differences were found between noise and quiet groups um, for perceived stress or um, self-reported health symptoms like headaches and difficulty sleeping. And few researchers have actually um, measured stress hormones in children. Um, but of those studies, sorry, of those studies, there were, was only one that was positive for adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol, which are the hormones released by the body under situations of stress. Um, there has been a link found between um, aircraft noise exposure and increases in children's blood pressure. Um, however, a lot of these studies had varying um, methodologies, and the investigators did not account for other factors that could contribute to increases in blood pressure, such as air pollution or diet. And so um, future research is needed on this topic to, to make any definitive conclusions. Um, there were two studies that looked at conduct disorder, hyperactivity, emotional stress, and um, peer relation problems um, in relation to aircraft noise. And 
there was actually no link found between um, higher craft noise exposure and the overall evaluation. Um, but there were two studies that did find an association between the aircraft noise exposure and hyperactivity. Um, but the investigators um, would like to see a replication of these results. So as many of you have already heard, when you think of noise impacts, hearing loss is one of the major things um, that have been shown in, in the evidence, more so in occupational settings and also in environmental settings in adults. Um, we know the levels at which uh, hearing loss can occur. But when we look through the field studies available, we actually only found three, but they were published in the 1990s, so a little, little bit dated. Um, two were negative, and one, was, one showed mild hearing loss for students near an airport. Um, but we do want to, or I, I do want to um, emphasize that you know, various agencies have put into place these standards um, in order to protect um, from hearing loss. So we, this, this is a concern in children as well. Um, and then there's some research where a vulnerable populations such as children have not been included, uh, one of which is sleep disturbance. Um, we know that sleep is important for learning, memory, and behavior, but there actually hasn't been research conduct conducted specifically for aircraft noise exposure um, in children um, and, and its impacts on, on sleep. But actually, the Federal Aviation Administration has recognized um, this topic as a high priority for future research. And to summarize the findings of um, the aircraft noise in children, we do see an association with multiple child health outcomes, with the most convincing evidence in for, for impaired learning, annoyance, and decreased motivation. And for the other health outcomes, you know, there's emerging hypotheses, but there is a need for more research to make definitive conclusions. Um, so we wanted to talk about these health effects in relation to what is going on on Whidbey Island. Um, as many of you know, the Lilly report was, the, which is here, um, reports on measurements that were taken of jet noise um, earlier this year in May. Um, they were conducted during jet practice sessions for outdoor measurements, and there was one indoor measurement in a private residence. So here is a map. This is from the Lilly Report that you can find there. Um, here is a map. These are the different positions. And um, we show here maximum noise levels measured in DBA, which DBA is a measurement that um, Karen mentioned. Um, so here we have the five locations. Um, so the maximum noise level is a range between 81.1 in the in indoor residence and 119.2. And the outdoor measurements are around these levels, 115 to 120. And these levels are uh, comparable to the sound of, as you can see over here, like an ambulance or being at a rock concert or being near a chainsaw. This, this is what um, these levels sound like. And out of all of the um, locations, the empty lot at the corner of Lockwood and Stark had the highest measurements. Can you point that out with your red dot there, the last place? Yes, so here is, here is the area where there's the highest levels. And I also wanted to point out that these two areas, these two stars here, are the approximate locations of, of schools um, in Coopville. So we also had um, the, noise ex the noise measurement expert calculate the average noise levels over the loudest 16 and 24 hours um, for the outdoor measurements. So here we can see them here. 
And um, so the ranges for the average 16 hours were between 69.8 and 76.7. For the 24 hour averages, the range was from 64.1 to 75. And in order to understand what these numbers really mean, um, we're going to compare them to the levels at which significant health effects were found in the literature that I just talked about, and also to guidelines that have been established by the World Health Organization and also Washington State. Oh, again, those are the schools. Okay, so I'm gonna go through what this graph means. Um, here we have the 24 hour averages um, for the four different outdoor locations and they're shown in purple, okay? Those are the bars. Then the 16 hour averages are shown in the brown bars for the four locations. These lines here the purple line represents the 24-hour average at which impaired reading comprehension in children was found in these scientific studies, while the brown line shows the 16-hour average at which this same um, effect was found in the literature. And as you can see here, all of the measurements that were taken on Coopville exceed this line at which this effect was observed, okay? So this graph shows the same um, measurements, but here these lines now represent the levels at which annoyance was observed in the scientific studies that I reviewed. Um, as you can see here, the 24 hour measurements, there's three that exceed this line. And then for the 16 hour measurements, all of them exceed this line, where annoyance effect was observed. Okay, so here we have, again, the 24 hour averages are in purple, and the maximum levels, a little bit of different measurement, are in blue, if you can see that. Um, and these lines represent the levels at which decreased motivation was found in the scientific studies. Um, all but one um, measurement on Coopville exceed these lines. So we also wanted to compare this data, these data um, to levels that have been established by organizations to protect public health, um, one of which is the World Health Organization. And they've, they've established a guideline of 50 for the max um, noise level um, to avoid annoyance effects. Here you can see that all of these exceed this line. Um, the WHO has also established a guideline, a health-based guideline, to avoid decreased motivation, increased helplessness at 80, and all of these exceed this line. This, is, this one's 81.1. And if we look at sleep disturbance, the WHO has established a guideline at 35 dBA, and all of them, all the measurements exceed this effect. Lastly, the hearing, hearing loss values for the general population, this is a, a max, and all, all of the all of the measurements exceed this. This measurement in particular is for children, to protect children from hearing loss. And this is what the WHO has established. So all but one exceed this line. Now if we take it close to home here in Washington State, um, the Department of Health has actually established guidelines for, um, for noise levels in schools in particular, which we have heard already is important for um, for children, you know, since they're be since they're at school a majority of the time, and um, this is for outdoor um, sites, and this is inside the classroom. All of them are exceeded. 
And lastly, the Washington State Department of Ecology has, which Karen already mentioned these, these guidelines, um, they have set up levels to protect the health in residential areas from noise of industrial, commercial, and other residential areas. And um, all the measurements on Coopville, near Coopville, exceed these levels. So now I'm going to pass it on to Catherine to kind of bring it all together. Um, hopefully that was uh, helpful. I, I thought it was great, <laughs> um, giving a little context for what we know about child health and, and putting a little into the context of uh, what we know from the, the measurements that have been done locally. So just to remind you, uh, you started out with some information from Karen Bowman summarizing, synthesizing the evidence base for adult health impacts. Um, which are summarized here, ranging from sleep disturbance to effects on cognition, um, cardiovascular-related outcomes, and then we just talked about some of these child health incomes, uh, outcomes, and, and particularly um, noting that many of the measurements um, in the community have exceeded the levels that are either set as health-based guidelines or uh, uh, where associations with adverse impacts have been seen in the in the child health studies. So I just want to have a couple of slides here, um, kind of moving beyond, okay, well, here's kind of what we know about these issues, how you might think about going forward. And, I, you know, this, you can take it or leave it, I guess, because really, um, you know, th our, our main role was to try to help you understand what's known about this topic in terms of adverse impacts. But one of the ways you might think about this um, and that we think about in our work in environmental or, or occupational health is this idea of ha hierarchy of hazard control. What can you do to reduce hazards once you identify them? And um, one of the fr common frameworks here uh, shows from sort of the top tier, you know, the best you can do to um, uh, strategies um, based on, you know, the level of burden and impact to make those changes. So at the very top tier, we have, well, take the hazard away. So, and that's always very effective. If you actually remove the hazard, we know you're gonna uh, protect for, in, for, from the, what we're concerned about is child health. If you remove, you know, lead exposure for the environment, they're not gonna get lead poisoning. If you remove excess noise or hazardous noise levels, you know, they're not gonna have impacts from noise. So in this case, that would be thinking about relocating this, this act, training activity. Next down uh, on this hierarchy of ways to control a hazard is to actually somehow disrupt the transfer of the hazard to the child or the adult um, so that you reduce the opportunity to induce some kind of adverse impact. And so you might think about where children spend time in the community, school, daycare, play areas, et cetera, and relocating those to areas that are not affected um, by high noise. Right. The other, uh, if that can't be done, engineering controls. Um, in places that, you know, in indoor environments, that's things like acoustic insulation. So again, just trying to, you know, put a barrier between the hazard and the affected uh, members in the community. And in looking forward, thinking about where siting decisions are for places that children spend time and designs of, of physical structures such as buildings. And then lower on the list, but sometimes things that you can do right away that don't take as long to uh, get into effect are things like education, you know, instructing children to avoid places where they're going to be exposed to loud noises. As you can see why the effectiveness kind of changes as you go down this list, but um, wearing, you know, hearing protection, um, child-sized, yeah, um, during, you know, high noise events, um, and then, of course, guarding children against other excessive noise exposures they may have in their lives beyond aircraft noise. So again, this is just kind of a, a framework for thinking about the levels that you might address a hazard. And then lastly, I just wanted to introduce this concept. Is anybody in the audience familiar with this concept of um, health impact assessment? Okay, a couple people. It's actually, you know, makes a lot of sense. It's, it's surprisingly new in a way. I mean, I know you're, many people are familiar with this concept of environmental impact assessment. But this health 
impact assessment is increasingly used in situations like this. A community um, has a hazard that they're trying to address, and in this case, you know, my, you could, I would make a plug for doing a health impact assessment that definitely includes a focus on child health for all of the reasons we discussed. And it puts into, you know, it, it basically does this assessment of what are the potential health impacts and what are the different impacts based on different strategies to either remediate or reduce the hazard. And so you can look at different scenarios and assess the health impacts and that can help the community form a, a decision. Um, so the CDC um, has a nice website that kind of talks about this process. There's you know, organizations and individuals that this is their bread and butter, but I just wanted to introduce that as a concept that might be useful as well. Um, in terms of other information, the, we produced a technical report with all the studies and the citations. It's kind of thick and long for most people, but you're definitely welcome to have a copy of that if you're interested. We also have it all distilled in a kind of one-page fact sheet with other, other places you might find information uh, and re resources related to a topic like this for you, including the EPA has a nice website on noise and child health, including a nice fact sheet that's more general on noise, not focused on aircraft. Um, we tried to create one that was focused on aircraft um, for this meeting. And I'm going to stop here, and uh, I think we're going to open it to questions for Karen, me, uh, Sarah, uh, Samantha, and comments. Thank you. I'm just curious. Um, you all work with uh, L&I, uh, Department of Ecology with the state, and you just mentioned the uh, CDC. Um, this is pretty much a small community group, and maybe I'm in error, but are we getting any help from state or federal agencies to address this situation and come up with solutions? Why not? I don't think I'm the best person to answer that question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Look around you, see who responds, see who doesn't respond. They're the guilty parties. Well, we have asked. We need to address that. No kidding. No kidding. Well, no kidding. Does anybody? Can, yeah. can I make a statement here? So, what you're doing right now, having community forums to educate your community members about the health effects related to this specific type of exposure, is very helpful. Um, and then just escalating it. I've been working policy and working on um, federal and state policy for over 10 years. I know that the, what is it, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And, <clears throat> and I gotta say, I didn't, this was not on my radar. Aircraft noise was not on my radar until Ken Picard called me up. And so I'm imagining that many, many people around Washington State and even in this community don't understand that there's an issue. We need to have more forums. And it really is, it's grassroots effort that change policy and get legislators to act and to let them know that, you know, this is what I always do with my students. I am watching you. You know, let your legislators know that that you're going to thank them or spank them. Come come time for, you know, vote, voting people in or out and let them know that 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 being in that position is directly related to what your what their feelings are and how they're going to vote for this and what kind of support you get. Well, I'm just thinking that for research right now would be the ideal time to measure first semester results comparing this semester with no noise with last year's first semester increased in standardized tests. So I don't know if Coopville High School, the elementary school, the, all of them. Uh, I don't know if any of you do studies or if there's someone that looking for a great opportunity to do a noise um, test. Um, on the learning ability of kids, this would be the ideal spot to do it, and now would definitely be the time. Yeah, I mean, you know, the researcher in me loves a comment like that because that's, you know, another day of my life. Uh, that's what I'm doing at the university is designing and conducting studies on health um, 
of children and environmental factors. And, you know, and, and much of the evidence base that uh, Samantha provided, actually, some of it, some of the best evidence is derived from these natural experiments where you can make comparisons because you can kind of control for, this is the same kid before and after. It's not like, this is a kid that lives here. That's, that's a different community. And, and we all know the things that affect things like learning, attention, you know, this is not one thing. There's, there's multiple factors. And so you have to really address that in a, in a good study design to, to have information on, well, what's the added impact or is there really an impact of noise or is it just that, you know, those, that community doesn't have as good schools or something like that. So it's a great, you know, it is fodder for a study. Um, I think the, the issues might be, first of all, you know, to get a study up and running does take time and so, you know, um, kind of matching a natural experiment can be tricky. Um, of course, it requires funding and having an adequate sample size. This is a relatively small community, so I don't know how many, you know, someone would have to kind of go through that, but it's, it's a good suggestion and it has been brought up, I think, by a couple of other people in our um, preparation for this is, is, are there local data or the chance? The, uh, the other way to look at it is, you know, do we really need to do a study here? Can we be informed by the research that's existing uh, to help us make decisions and the best decision for our community. And, and so I think thinking about the best use of resources or, you know, what you can do with, um, you know, we do in this situation, it's not like some areas in children's environmental health, we really don't have much to go on. It's very theoretical and we're hypothesizing, but here there is a pretty good evidence base. And so, you know, thinking of whether it makes sense to scurry and try to pull together a study in this community versus, you know, take advantage of the fact that we actually do have a scientific evidence base we can maybe do a little work with here to have some useful information. Um, that being said, having been involved in some various community-based issues like this before, there's nothing like grown, homegrown data um, to convince, to, you know, to, to motivate and convince uh, and just, you know, bring it home for people. So there's, that's a lot of different answers to your question. What, what type of uh, hearing uh, protection devices would you recommend we use? I'm going to give that one to Nancy Baudet, our exposure scientist uh, specialist on that, because that's her, you know, extra, extra expertise. So I have not thought about hearing protection for a while. I've not done field occupational health work, but couple of things immediately come to mind. Hearing protection, the earplugs that you put in your ears, those have a noise reduction rating. All of them are rated. And so what I would recommend is you select uh, the hearing protection with the highest rating that you can find. You know, usually it's 35 or 40, 45 decibels. And you could call a safety supply store down in Seattle and buy a box of 100 you know, and there is training required on how to insert them to ensure that they are effective. Now, I, I did read that there are uh, hearing protectors for children too. I'm not as familiar with those. I've not had firsthand experience with them. In addition to the hearing protection, the little, um, the little foam plugs, there are the muffs. If you go over to Boeing, you know, there's quite a bit of noise there, and they have muffs that have, are more effective. However, if you wear glasses, that can disrupt the effectiveness of that level of, that type of protection. So those are the two primary types of protection. Do you want to add to that? Okay. Um, as a former audiologist, there are also molds that can be yes. made. Right. Uh, by the audiologists, and many of them have diaphragms in them um, that attenuates the noise when it reaches a, a specific level. So, and they're form-fitted to uh, personalize to everybody's ears. Did, what, is everybody able to hear that? that? So what she is saying, she's an audiologist, and she said that there are molded, custom molded hearing protectors that can be uh, custom ordered, you would go to an audiologist, I'm assuming, and that they actually attenuate the noise at a higher degree when you're exposed to higher levels of noise. And those are, I think they're about a hundred dollars, how much are, yeah. about a hundred dollars for a set. And I think like the foam type, those probably, if you buy a box of a hundred, I'd say they're, you know, 50 cents. There's a major problem with the foam ones, sorry. <laughs> 
there's a major problem with the foam ones because of the amount of attenuation that they do supply. And it is uh, technically really only about uh, anywhere from about 28 to maybe 32. So going to 40 is a little bit extreme. The insertion is significant because quite often there is, uh, uh, people have all kinds of different ear canals, some are more tortuous, twisted. Uh, some people have a jawbone that goes into their, their temporal mandibular joint that goes into their ear canal so they're not quite as well protected. And particularly in children, there are smaller ones, but it's much harder to get in. Uh, we also have to remind ourselves that it cuts off uh, warning signals. And that's it goes down yeah, yeah. by the children. question? So when we're talking about personal protective equipment, as um, Catherine was talking about, that's the lowest um, effective engineering control or hierarchy of controls that we have. And for the audiologist's reasons, people don't know how to put them in, people's bodies are different, they really don't block out the noise that we think it do, that, that it does. The best thing, the highest thing up that Catherine was talking about was eliminating the source. So remember about eliminating the source. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Um, my, I, my chest starts hurting, and I, if I start crying, I'm sorry. But this is bullshit. <laughs> that we're dealing with here. And I'll be ding-dipped if I'm gonna wear earplugs all night long while I'm trying to watch TV and talk to my friends and all that kind of stuff. So what I wanna know is, is there a representative in the Navy that is hearing these studies? She just left, she got mad and left and I asked her to identify herself. Yeah, and. And how do, how do we... Jennifer Meyer oh. said, I, when you I asked her to identify herself before she spoke. She said, I refused, and she left. That's your Navy. Oh, that's my Yeah. Job. So is there anyone else in the Navy that we can write to, that we can call, that we can email? CNO. I mean, do we have... Pardon? CNO. Secretary of the Navy. Okay, and, and, and can we get a... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. Uh, we do have, Marianne is holding up, Marianne is holding up one of the EIS comment sheets. You can get them back to us. You can bring them to the meeting. You can sign them and turn them in. You could, there is some place you can email them. I always say, a voice not raised is a voice not heard. And it's time to raise our voice. I want to say something that is almost funny. Uh, this is the first time I'm in a group like this, and I just come from DC. The pattern there is, I was surprised, my daughter lives pretty close to DCA airport, Reagan airport. 10 o'clock at night, no flight comes back. And they all fly over the Potomac, not over the residences. Then at 6 o'clock in the morning, they start. So you have a beautiful, quiet night. And that is commercial flying. Nobody has a problem really with that. that you can't compare the two. Um, on our website, Citizens of EB's Reserve, there is a contact list with your representatives, your county commissioners, the mayor, uh, our people in Congress. Write them an email. Write them a letter. You know what you're going to get back. Dear Mr. Johnson, thank you very much for your interest in the agriculture of the lower Yakima Valley. That's the response you'll get. And we've, I've gotten, you know, I could fill a file folder with them. Keep on going. Keep on calling your people. Just a remark to the lady who spoke about her daughter at DCA. You know why it's quiet there and they don't have flights? Mm -hmm. DC National. 
I, I have a question to ask you folks. Uh, there's a group that wasn't even represented here tonight is the agricultural workers that have to be out there in the heat trying to wear your phones? I don't think so. Um, what are the regulations on noise protection for our agricultural workers? Because that's what this community does. And they're outside. The occupational rules and regulations, which are um, the hearing conservation program that we mentioned before, 85 decibels, you're required, a company is required to provide hearing conservation, education, audiogram testing, and hearing protection. Don't be discouraged. I want to say don't be discouraged. Keep plugging. Keep calling your legislators. Keep calling the mayor. Keep calling your representatives because they do take a tally. You know, talk to the legislative assistant. They're the eyes and ears of the legislators. I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been working in environmental law for 10 years. And they take, they, they keep a checklist. They keep a checklist because you guys vote them in. You guys vote them in. You can vote them out. I have a question about whether um, any research has been done on what the Navy has done to mitigate jet noise for schools and residences that reside on Navy property. I've lived on Whidbey Island off and on for 20 years, and Culver Valley Elementary was an elementary school very close to the uh, the main base up in Oak Harbor, and now it's, yeah, I, I don't know what the function of it is. I know the school district has been using it for other things, but there's also Navy housing that's still there. There are people living in the housing there, so I'm just curious, is, has anybody looked into have there been any um, mitigations or studies or behavioral practices around flight scheduling uh, related to the school or the residences there? I'll, uh, if, if I had a child uh, in Clover, I'd move. I'll ask Sam if she could, has anything to say. I think most of the studies that are available on children related to chronic aircraft noise are from commercial airports and so are not studies done on military sites. I, I, I don't know, do you have any comment on that, Samantha? Is there any information on, I know that they've had to address, you know, some of the studies did address remediation and, you know, things that were done um, at, at household levels and such, but I don't know if there's anything specific to military. Yeah, I didn't have anything specific to military, but. In, in the review of the literature, yeah, I didn't find anything specific to the military and, um, the school. Were there any instructions or policy changes or instructions to squadrons at Whitby about where and when to fly, given that there are I think I can answer that from observations. Um, I, um, first of all, please come to the scoping meeting. We really need you there. You have to tell your story. You have to let them know. The last scoping meeting for the P-8 had 29 people there. They don't believe that we care. If we're not heard, nothing happens. Second of all, you asked about Clover Valley. I was down there four days ago with F-18s flying directly overhead. And they not only have an active school, but they have a nursery school. And four to five-year-olds were outside playing with F-18s flying overhead. So, and here's the one more quick thing. I was at the P-8 meeting a week ago. Uh, they had a nice board up, kind of like your ladies there, where they said that the P-8 maximum decibel reading over the P3 would be maybe one decibel, maybe two, that would be it. I asked the gentleman two different times because I couldn't believe his answer, because his answer to me was one to two decibels. I said, but I have read in your own EIS study that at maximum departure rates, the decibel rate can be as high as 24 decibels more. I asked him twice to see if he would tell me it a second time. He did. Show up. Show up. With your, with your information, with your anger, with your love for your grandchildren and your children in hand with you. They need to hear the truth of how we live. Go on, Becky. We've been presented tonight with some very good information. And it seems like 
am I, hopefully I didn't misunderstand, that there are laws in place that the Navy is in violation of. And I don't like the word compliance. Why don't we say that they're, you know, that they're breaking the law? So we've got the laws of the land, but they're not enforced. So we've got attorneys. Fortunately, this group is smart enough to get attorneys. And it seems to me they're pushing the one thing that really is going to go. Uh, they're getting statistical information to give it to the right people who have the education to say the right words the right way that the other people can't put down or dispel, as they can any common person who doesn't have a degree. So where are we at? We're at a situation where meetings and meetings and meetings, and my hearing is going. I've lived here for 27 years, and I'm hard, I can't hardly hear, okay? Now I know why, because I was a manager of corporations. I never wasn't around any loud machine or anything else, but I bought a nice home on the water here that the jets love to fly over. I just spent $12,000 replacing my windows in my house because they were blown out by the new aircraft, which comes over my house, they nose up to make their turn, and their jets are right at my windows. I have an octagon house. I have nine windows that go around it. They blew them all out, $12,000 worth. So I want to say is that it's money. We're up against money. Money doesn't want this to happen because they're afraid that, oh, gee, it's going to crumble down all the stores and everything else. Yes, I know. You want me to cut me off. But I want to say they need money. This group, if we're going to fight this situation, we're not going to do it to the point to where we run out of money. So, sincerely, they need money. Thank you. Thank you. I have a comment to make. One, all the, the, the rules and regulations, the laws that, in pla that are in place, the Navy usurps them. And, and secondly, you had mentioned about um, getting all us smart people quote, unquote, smart people with degrees. First of all, smart, not all people who have degrees are smart. And, and, and secondly, they don't care. You know, I've been working policy for 10 years. They don't care about my opinion. They aren't going to care about Catherine's opinion. They, they are going to care about the research. They care about your opinion. They care about your opinion and your opinion and your opinion. And there was a young woman over there talking about um, showing up to the EIS Forum, you got to show up. You have got to show up because every one of you has a story, and the legislators listen to the stories. My background is it has been working um, policy with toxics, environmental toxins, and I know that when we have a mother who comes in and says, "I'm worried about my child being exposed to toxic chemicals," in this case, it would be my child being exposed to loud noise. I'm worried um, that they aren't going to have the ability to grow up, that they're going to be you know, deaf. Those have impact to your legislators. And Catherine was talking about the health impact statement. Don't forget about the health impact statement, because Washington State is starting to understand what a health impact statement is. We've been working on the coal trains. Have you guys heard the stories about the coal trains coming around? Well, we're, well, we're working on health impact statements for those. And so now they're understanding that the health impact statements, along with the environmental impact statements, are critical because the health impact statements talk about our impact, the health impact of the, of the community members. So don't, don't forget what Catherine's talking about with that. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, I know someone earlier tonight asked about uh, what's happening at our, our Whidbey General Hospital. And how do we get data that has correlation to some of the information that you brought out tonight about cardiovascular uh, hypertension and, and negative? And the ICD-9 codes? Yeah. How, how, do we, how do we get that information from our local hospital? Catherine? <laughs> well, I think it, it, the question is similar to the one earlier tonight, and it's kind of thinking about, you know, does it make sense to do that? Would you get good yield from that? And I think it would take um, kind of working with someone who's used to designing a study and, you know, honing your study question, figuring out whether you can really do a study that would come yield some meaningful results. Um, at the top of my head, I do worry a little bit about sample size and power in a small place. 
Um, and again, I, I guess thinking about really what your goal is, do you want to, you know, show that it happens here, even though there's a pretty good robust evidence base that this is an issue, you know, versus, but, but, you know, sometimes there is this sense of we have to, I have to say, I, I work in Vietnam with a lead poison village where kids have astronomically high lead levels. And, you know, everybody in, around the world would say, that's too, you know, that's bad, that's too high, it's, you know, 40 times what kids in the U.S. have. But, you know, sometimes people say, in Vietnam, we're not going to change our regulation or our law until we show that it's having an effect on our children. So I, I, I get that, but I, I do think it's worth pausing and thinking about, you know, what makes the most sense for your energy and resources and, and whether really it will add in the end to helping you inform your decision making. And you might be able to work with, you know, existing studies. Okay, I'd like to take one. Uh, it's enough. It's enough. I was deeply disturbed tonight. If there was anybody in here who was not deep, deeply disturbed, you didn't ask the right questions. I'd like to thank our presenters again. If you've been lulled, like myself, maybe by this wonderful hiatus and think, well, maybe they're going to go away. Go by OLF and see the concrete barricades they're putting all the way around to yeah. protect us or it from us or terrorists or what. I would like to add something to take to the next um, meeting that they're going to have, like December 3rd, 4th, and 5th meetings, is that in the Navy, there is high, high priority for hearing protection amongst the military members because the highest amount of compensation paid out through our tax dollars is for noise-induced hearing loss and tinnitus. So just a reminder that's their own. And just a reminder also, Jennifer Meyer was here. She asked to speak. I said, yes. I said, would you identify yourself first? She said, no. I said, may I identify you after you speak? She got up and left. That's your Navy. <laughs> Helen? I do want to say that we had two council people here tonight, and that is progress for us. Oh, that's nice. Bob Clay was here tonight, and Molly Hughes was here, was here tonight. So we're creeping onto Main Street, and that is what each of you has to go out and do. You need to talk to your neighbors and your friends, convince, convince people who are on the chamber. You can look at who they are on, on the Chamber of Commerce list. And we need to convince our people here that um, we're all one community and we want to see a sustainable central Whidbey and Coopville for the future. And you've got till December 2nd to enter your comments on the PHA oh, online the PHA. And, and they will probably um, limit what you say to the PHA, so the, the one that's up and coming um, with the open house that involves the growlers is far more important. And one more thing that this lady just mentioned, um, jobs, 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 that's what matters to, to Rick Larson. And he serves a lot more communities than, than Coopville. So if we don't speak up to Rick Larson and to others and say that even though we're in the minority, and that doesn't include just Coopville, includes Oak Harbor as well, that we've got to stick together on this thing and let our voices be known. Otherwise, we don't have a chance. They're already breaking the law with the OSHA rules. One more. You're the, final, the final one. The final comment. Better be good. <laughs> I'll try. So I'm Angie Hamola, and I just want to say in full disclosure, I'm a Navy wife. My husband flies P3s. He's on deployment right now in Japan. And he has shared with me that the Japanese defense budget is uh, somewhere between 7 and 9%. Ours is 57%. Um, I advocated for the P8A. I hope it wasn't a mistake. I did that because I felt like if we had a diverse base here with multiple platforms, that we would have some diversity and not only growlers and prowlers. Uh, P3s are driven by 
propellers. They're fairly quiet. The P8A may not be as quiet. I recommended the other night at the P8A meeting that it would be great if they actually brought the planes and tested them here, which was a suggestion of my husband. And I was told that all these studies are being done, the scientific studies, and that it wasn't necessary to test them here. Flyover. That would be very helpful. Flyover. And I would say um, none of those Navy folks want to hurt the people that they represent. They go there to, quote, protect our freedom, but they protect our nation so that we have the quality of life we expect to have as Americans. And they don't want to damage us. So it's up to us to ask the difficult questions of, how many planes do we need? How many ships do we need? How many flights do we need? What kind of equipment are we going to give our sailors and soldiers to use so that they are protected and they are protected in how they operate over us? So we should be asking those tough questions. I had a friend that and how many laws? I had a friend that said, "We need wars to test the equipment. Who's making the equipment?" So it's up to us to ask those tough questions and protect those people who protect us so that we do have the quality of life that we expect as Americans. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you for allowing us to come and present this information.